C++'s superpower. What is C++'s superpower? I mean, I'm sure everyone has their own idea about why they love C++, uh, whether you're a veteran or whether you're new to the language. Uh, there's going to be something there that you will be uh, thinking about, I, I think. Anyway, like start, start thinking, what do you think C++'s superpower is? So, well, if we're going to talk about C++'s superpower, well, if I'm going to put focus in the right window, then my click is going to work. There we go. C++'s superpower, uh, we need, uh, you know, C++ man here, which uh, Hanna Dusikova put together for me, thankfully. Uh, so uh, what do you think uh, the superpower for C++ is? I mean, um, it could be many things, right? So I did a Twitter poll about the best and the worst of C++, and some of these things came up as the people's favorite or uh, the candidates for like the, the killer feature for C++. So it could be the ubiquity of C++, right? We know C++ is everywhere. It's running on my desktop computer here. It's running on my cell phone. It runs on like the thermostat that I've just had to turn on to put the heating on because it's freezing here. Um, it runs literally everywhere. It's in space. Uh, ubiquity is a real important factor and being able to target various different devices and know that it's going to be performant enough to run on tiny little embedded devices as well as run in huge clusters it makes it very powerful. Maybe that's C++'s superpower. Um, that, that brings us to the performance, right? Uh, C++ is known for being able to allow us to achieve performance. It's not necessarily fast in of itself, but we can really reason quite a lot about the kind of performance characteristics we're going to get out of the code we write. And if we really need to, we can drop all the way down to assembly and, and kind of make things go as fast as we like or you know, lay out memory in particular ways to make it go super fast. So maybe performance is the superpower of C++. Of course, there are different ways of writing code. Um, there's, you know, object orientated, there's functional, there's just boring procedural, there's, there's, and then everything in between. And many languages make you pick one or so of those approaches, whereas C++ doesn't really have a strong opinion. That, that's both a blessing and a curse, right? Uh, C++ lets you write object-oriented code and functional code and kind of mix and match them together. It's multi-paradigm. And that means that you can write some super-focused, high-performance, like straight-line code, but you can, in the same code base, have large amounts of very um, high-level, abstract, template, metaprogramming-type constructs too. And then, of course, there's a continuum between those as well. So maybe multi-paradigm programming is the superpower of C++. Um, but the one that I would have said before I thought up this talk uh, would be the clear object lifetime of C++. One of the sort of killer features of C++ is that we know when our objects are going to go out of scope and we can make reasoned assumptions about uh, uh, when those destructors are going to run, which allows us to manage memory efficiently, which allows us to man man manage things like file handles, database connections, all those things. What I'm talking about, of course, is RAII, the thing we, we know and love. And being able to lean on that gives us an awful lot of power. And maybe that is its superpower. Um, but, you know, oh, and while we're here, sorry, I forget, I put all these things in the last minute. Never change your slides at the last minute, folks. Uh, Pavel Novikov will be talking about constructors and destructors in his talk tomorrow. So if you want to talk more about those, I would catch that tomorrow. But let's talk about the things that clearly is, are not C++'s superpowers. Let's look at the other side of it, sort of the kryptonite of C++. So undefined behavior is, in fact, probably the top of the list here. We all know and love undefined behavior. And by love, I mean not love. Although, actually, strictly speaking, if we talk about undefined behavior, it does open up the door to a whole bunch of optimizations, which is kind of the performance side of things. But trying to remember which things are undefined and which things aren't undefined and all that kind of stuff is a massive pain, I think you'll agree, right? It would be nice if everything was just defined. So it, that's not a superpower. Maybe that's the kryptonite. It's has got some terrible defaults. Um, I know that we we go on about this a lot of the time, but you know, for, for people coming new, newly into the language, we sometimes have to say, oh, yeah, yeah, so that doesn't work the way you would imagine it does because... It never used to work this way at all, and then we had to change it. So, but we have to be backwards compatible for the other stuff. So, I'm sorry, you just have to remember that it doesn't go the way that you would want it to. Things like um, implicit constructors, you know, having to put explicit everywhere. Why is that not the default? It's a shame, right? But we can't change it. So, the wrong defaults are a pain. 
as is like this or any kind of legacy support we've got all this kind of stuff that's cluttering up the language from um yesteryear and that's not necessarily a good thing especially if we have to teach it and um, and it's got confusing syntax as a result of that. I don't think anyone would have designed um, C++ to look the way it does today, but we kind of got here through a meandering set of uh, of small changes to uh, a core, uh, small additions, I should say, rather than changes. And that's a bit of a bit of a shame. And that means things like um, having to recycle keywords from before. If you remember, um, I, I don't imagine anyone here has ever used the auto keyword using in its old sense. You know, from from C days because that would used to be what um, automatic storage was. As in anything that wasn't static is automatic, and you know auto in I was what you could write before. Um, no one did that though, of course, because in I was also what was the default to be uh, um, dynamic storage. So you know we had to recycle the auto keyword for, for for today because we didn't want to introduce a new one. Anyway, very confusing uh, in places, lambda syntax, all that kind of stuff. But you know. Anyway, what I want to say today is that those two in the middle together actually are C++'s superpower. That is, backwards compatibility is C++'s superpower. Now, I appreciate many of you are like going, no, it isn't. And you would, <laughs> reasonably so. But I'm going to try and make it my job today in the next hour or so to convince you that C++'s superpower is in fact it's backwards compatibility. And I'm going to do that through the medium of demonstration, um, showing you why that's cool, how it can be achieved, and moreover, why you should care about it. Because right now, I'm sure you're thinking, I don't need backwards compatibility. It's a millstone. So my goal today is to take some old code, and I've picked 25-year-old code here because that's as old as my career, give or take, and I'm going to port it to modern C++ 17. Now, of course, we're in 2021, and C++ 20 is mostly out. Uh, ideally, I would have picked C++ 20, but I actually started this project 18 months ago. So um, there's a bit of lag here. So I will talk a little bit about how this relates to C++ 20, but the actual project I'm going to be describing targeted C++ 17. So the cool thing about all of this, though, and the key thing, is that I'm going to be able to do this incrementally, almost line by line, I'm going to port this code base uh, from old, mostly C code to contemporary modern C++ 17. And that, I think, is the key to the superpower, is that I can do this incrementally. I don't have to like rewrite my project, like module or file at a time. I can do it almost line by line. And I'm also going to try and explain to you why that, why you should care, why this is important. And along the way, <clears throat> excuse me, along the way, we're going to see some really choice bits of ancient code and how uh, uh, how you can improve them using modern C++ idioms. So we get a bit of that along the way too. The question I'm sure you're shouting your screen right now is, but Matt, where will you find 25-year-old code? Surely such stuff does not exist, right? Well, let's think about what was happening 25 years ago. So 25 years ago. In 1996, the Spice Girls were in the charts. USB had just been introduced. And I was studying for a physics degree at Exeter University. And yes, I do. That, I don't know why my Harry Potter glasses that I was wearing back then. One second. So at university, I said I was studying for a physics degree. I was really, most of the time, programming on computers, and also spending a lot of time in the computer lab playing games. I'm sure we've all experienced something a little like that in our, in our life when we should have been doing something else, but we were actually playing games. What games was I playing? I was playing MUDs. Now, most of you probably don't know what a MUD is, but a MUD is a multi-user dungeon. It's a text-based game. So do you remember those adventure games from, you know, retro adventure games where the computer would describe to you in text, you are in a room filled with bags, there are exits to the north and south, there is a dragon here, that kind of stuff. And then you would type in commands like go north or kill dragon, that kind of thing. That's what I'm talking about, those kinds of games. Except that the MUDs were more heavily based on Dungeons and Dragons, so there's a lot more round-based combat spells and things. And they were multiplayer there were other people who were logged into the mud at the same time. So think World of Warcraft 
or EverQuest, but using text only. Um, and you could connect to it just for the choice of uh, using Telnet to talk to a particular port on the computer. You got a login prompt, you logged in with your character, and off you go. So this was captivating to me and some of my friends at university. Um, and we were captivated so much that as well as playing them, we decided we would make our own. So this is a snapshot of uh, the the website associated with our uh, our mud and uh, some code some output even from the mud. Uh, so Zania was the name of our multi user dungeon. We're lucky that um, although there was no GitHub back in 1996, there were like tables of source. So we didn't write the whole thing from scratch. Far from it. We inherited a code base from. Um, uh, friends called ROM, Rivers of Mud, which itself was based on a code base called Merck, which I forget the acronym for, which itself was based on some, uh, I think, a master's project from, uh, I think, the University of Denmark called Deku. So there's a number of folks who worked on that project. So there's a long lineage, even in 1996, of code, and it showed in the code base. The code base was full of if defs for VAX and Solaris and all these kinds of things, as you can imagine, quite a mess. We inherited it, and then we heavily customized it and we also uh, added a ton of content. We'll to be talking about all of that in a second. So you can see on the right-hand side here, we, well, one of the things we added was ANSI color. So you know the fancy color sequences you can see that give us you know these, these pretty bars and things was, was uh, something we had added ourselves. So pretty, pretty exciting stuff. I'm sure you can agree, right? You can understand how I lost three years of my life to this, right? And so this is the piece of code we're going to be working on Today, I'm going to take that code from 96, and we're going to bring it forward to the wonderful things that we have available to us now. So what is a MUD, really? It's a giant text processor. It takes text in, even loads text from files that describe all the monsters and the rooms and all that kind of stuff. And, um, and it takes the user input, which is text, and it generates, well, text to say, hey, yeah, you did this thing. So it's mostly a text processor. Text processing in C, probably not the first choice of language, I think you'll agree. And you'll see some really scary bits of code in a second, especially for something which is connected to the public internet, right? Um, but unfortunately, at the time, the machines that we could run these things on were shared like 200 megahertz Solaris machines. So there were like 100 other students, and we were running our MUD as just an, a user-level process and in amongst 100 folks sharing a 200 megahertz computer. So it was important, and in fact, some of the code was very carefully handcrafted to be fast, uh, to be super efficient. Let's sort of clear the ground, right? So how are we going to start this pro project? Well, the first thing is I need to find that code. Luckily, I am a giant digital hoarder, and I have every hard disk I've ever had in a box in my basement. So I went rummaging around on those, which is always fun. You know, you find old emails, um, pictures from old girlfriends, and things like that, which was, was, was a lot of fun. Um, and I found the source code, which was great. The source code was in a pretty bad state. There were a ton of... Um, like things like log files and player files. You know, this this was a publicly run service for many years. So there's a lot of stuff like PII based stuff that wouldn't stand these days. So I deleted all of that. And when I was left, what I was left with is something which was around 50,000 lines of C and about 700 lines of C++. We actually did have some C++. I was starting to learn C++. And so we were adding little pieces of C++ in, in around the edges, but not in a very principled way and certainly not in a very um, stylistically pure way. <laughs> I don't show any of my old C++ code, but it's all on Git. You'll see at the end. You can go and laugh at it if you want. And then we actually had 700 lines of Perl and Make to hold the whole thing together, which is quite a lot of stuff for a, such a relatively small project. So what did I do? So even before we start talking about modernizing the code base, let's just talk about like the ground rules, the simple basic things that we need to get done first, or the things that I consider as a prerequisite before we even start doing uh, uh, any actual code changes, significant code changes. Well, first thing I did was to th throw it into Git. Uh, you know, even for silly home projects, I always use Git. And in fact, I don't know about anybody else here, I actually have a bit of a fear now about modifying any file that isn't in source control, like just even configuration settings on my computer. I get little heart palpitations worrying about, well, what if I make, muck it up? Well, I want to go back to the old version. So everything goes in Git. I also ported the, the Makefile-based solution to CMake, not because I needed to, but because actually it played better with my IDEs at the time. 
I formatted all the code. You can imagine that a 25-year-old piece of code that's been through as many different people as I described at the beginning has quite a selection of interesting code formatting styles, mixes, mixtures of spaces and tabs and different indentations and all that kind of stuff. So putting it through Clang format with a somewhat tweaked format um, uh, settings cleared it up a, a bunch. I turned on all the warnings and I turned them up to maximum and actually did W error as well, which obviously is great if it's just your own code. So, you know, any any kind of uh, warning would be an error. And I also turned on all the sanitizers that I possibly could that would run together. Uh, I didn't turn on the thread san sanitizer because we didn't have threads. That would have been far too... Um, um, excited. Oh, sorry, my cat is now going to join me. So I apologize if, uh, if something gets knocked off. Um, actually, turning on the warnings and the sanitizers picked up a few things straight away. Uh, it will not surprise you that 25-year-old C code uh, had a few... Um, undefined behavior related things they were pretty straightforward to fix actually most of them were things where costs needed to be added that were otherwise being implied and um some strange shifts there's there's a lot of bit fields and bit manipulation inside the code and uh, no no please don't come over here cat <laughs> oh she's coming anyway well this is seraphina <laughs> there we go um can you go on the floor please my love there you are you don't get that in a conference in person <laughs> what was i saying i was saying that uh wall extra yes um there were some signed shifts that were undefined behavior and the sanitizer picked those up so we fixed those are pretty straightforward i added conan support for conan um conan plays quite nicely with cmake as well so the whole thing can be mostly hidden away conan is a package manager and vc package is another great package manager but i only have experience with conan so that's what i used conan allowed me to then pick up um some libraries i wanted to add catch2 for testing lib fmt or sorry fmt lib um the formatting library and uh what was the other one? Oh yeah ranges v3 and, and amongst a bunch of other things. And I find that as soon as you add a package management solution to a project, it becomes a trivial thing to say, well, let's just add this other package. You know, let's add this dependency in. You don't have to worry so much about it. And that makes it a lot more flexible and certainly faster to turn around um, additions to the code. Whereas if you have to download code and unpack it into places or sudo apt install it or whatever, then it's, there's a barrier to it, right? So adding a package manager makes your life easier. And then obviously, once I'd done all this, I ran and tested it. And testing at this stage is loading up the mud, running around, killing some monsters, making sure nothing obvious is going wrong. But we're going to fix that as we go. Yeah, it's worth saying that there were no actual tests at all in the original code base because we didn't know what testing was because we were a bunch of you know, teenagers. Uh, if you're interested in CMake, uh, there's a talk about it later on today. Demo. Okay, I'd forgotten I'd moved this to here, so I'm not actually as prepared as I should be. Of course, you want to see what a mud looks like because you're excited by what uh, it could be. So this is um, this is me connecting to the mud. I'm actually using a mud client here. Uh, this is um, slightly more sophisticated than just a raw TCP connection. It allows me to um, have an editable. Um, uh, you know, I've got I've got full you know read line here. I can move around inside the thing. Um, so. Um, yeah, let me log in and remember my password, which is still the terrible password I had from when I was 20. And does my terminal support ANSI color? Of course it does. We want the beautiful colors. So here I am logged in, and I left my character in a particular place, and he's asleep. So while I'm asleep, I can only look at stats and things. I can say, what is my score? And it tells me that I am Kissa, the Delver in spells. I'm a level 12 orc mage and i have all these stats about me i'm affected by some the, the some spells here um so you know let's have a look around oh i can't i'm asleep so let's wake up okay i wake and stand up and now let's look and here i am i'm in the world um I, the graphics are second to none i'm sure you'll agree uh there's a druid here apparently there are exits to the south up and down let's go south and uh i'm going to go south again and uh, here i am in the temple square oh someone has just arrived now there's nobody actually playing the mud at the moment unless somebody has logged in by working out where it is uh, it is publicly available and i'll give you the address at the end if you're a laugh 
Uh, this is a non-player character. So this Concordius character is someone who wanders around this area and, uh, you know, greets you and just generally is just there to make it feel more immersive. I'm sure you, you can agree it feels that. Um, and obviously being a Dungeons & Dragons type game, you know, you gain experience points by killing monsters. Uh, there's a rat in this room here. And so, I, you know, I can kill the rat. I'm hundreds of levels higher than the rat here, so the rat dies immediately. Normally, there'd be some back and forth and some combat and casting spells and parrying and dodging and all that kind of stuff. But you get the idea, right? Oh, there's a head of a gutter up here. There's a fountain. Let's drink from the fountain. And let's, you know, what, what's my inventory? I'm carrying a whole bunch of things. What's my equipment? I think you get the idea, right? So this is the kind of thing that was absolutely captivating to me. And um, I'm going to just log out now, otherwise I will come back and I will have eaten all my food. Okay, that's what we're talking about. That's the mud. That's actually the current version that's running now in, in, in production, I was going to say. Oh, dear. So let's talk about actually making some changes to this code now. So it's mostly C, and I'm going to forget about the C++ that was written before. The first thing we want to do is convert all that C to C++, which should just be as simple as renaming all of the files from C to CPP, right? I mean, after all, we all see these uh, people who are, you know, uh, uh, the, the refer to C slash C++ as a single programming language, they're basically the same, right? So I rename the files, and then I run the build system, and it didn't work. And I'm wondering if there's anyone here, at home, you know, again, this is something to play at home, uh, what trivial valid C program is not a valid C++ program? So just have a think about that, because I... The, I, I didn't think about it myself until until this, because let's think about this, right? C++ and Dungeons and & Dragons, other than like the kind of people who like C++ probably also like Dungeons & Dragons and vice versa, what one word could go in this Venn diagram between the two? What one word is really, really common in both C++ and Dungeons and & Dragons? And I'm really looking, I've got some things popping up on the side here, but I'm assuming uh, <laughs> that's people talking about other things. It is, of course, the word class. So in Dungeons and Dragons, your class is whether you're a mage or a cleric or a wizard or a barbarian or a fighter or whatever. And in C++, of course, class is a keyword. Class is not a keyword in C. So despite all my protestations about backwards compatibility, this was the one big change we had to make before we even started. I had to find all the variables that were called class and rename them to be something else. Similarly, there were other new keywords that were added, new being one, template, and namespace. We had a few things that were called new, and we had a couple of things that were called template that also had to be renamed. But that's a fun little thing to, 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 to write, realize that, uh, of course, not all C programs are valid C++. Okay, so we then got everything building and running as C++, although no actual functional changes were made whatsoever. My process in general is going to be to make the smallest possible incremental change that I can make test it, which initially will be manual testing, but later will be, I won't say test-driven development, but like test-informed development. This is a hobby project after all. I'm not, not doing this formally. And what I would like to sort of push as an idea is when you're doing this kind of work is to do it incrementally and small and don't be tempted to start pulling on the thread of interconnected changes um, and change what would be a small change into a big change. It's really, really tempting to do. You're like, oh, yeah, oh, no, this is terrible too. I better change that as well. And before you know it, your, your change is huge and you can't easily reason about it. You can't undo it. You can't revert it. So where you, I discover parts of the code base that could be improved, um, but not as part of this change, I'm going to put a to-do in the code. And I'm going to be principled about those to-dos. And we're definitely going to come back to them later but it gives you the permission to make a small change while not freaking out and worrying that you're going to forget to do some other important changes later on. I'm going to use three different techniques here, one of which you've probably heard of, which is test-driven development here at the bottom. CEDD and Jaraswood are two new techniques which you probably are already using, but you just didn't know they had names. So we'll get to those in a minute. I'm going to start with this structure. Um, we're going to spend a bunch of time talking about this structure and the slow incremental C++ -ification, if that's a word, uh, of this structure and everything that goes along with it. And then we'll talk about some sort of choice bits of code um, that can be changed separately. But we're going to start here. This is the area data structure. An area is a group of 
rooms and the monsters that live in them and the items that those monsters have or are lying on the floor. And also the rules about like when the monsters respawn, whether the monsters wander around, some primitive script language to let them do interesting things like you saw Concordius moving around in the, in the previous uh, level. Uh, an area is a text file that we load and parse to fill in and populate the area data structure, separately some room structures and some um, mob structures that are like the player characters, sorry, the non-player characters. A mob is short for mobile uh, because they're things that move. And also the objects. Excuse me. Um, this is the area data. It's like the metadata about an area. And I've cut it down for slideness. But this is mostly the code that you'll see if you go to GitHub. So how could we how could we possibly improve this beautiful piece of code? Right. Well, let's look at the the, the obvious stuff. Right. First of all, we're in a linked list here. There's a next pointer in this object, as there are in almost every object in the entire MUD. That pointer is there because every single item is in a linked list of like all the items, all the areas, all the mobs, all the objects, or like all the player inventories. There's especially for objects, they're they they're in about four different linked lists. And they're hand rolled singly linked lists because that's what you could do in C. And um we can improve on that, obviously. We don't need to use um uh, our own hand-rolled stuff for that. We've got mutable strings. Now, I don't know about you, but certainly the C code that I'm used to seeing uh, tends to treat const correctness as kind of an afterthought, and this is definitely true of this code base. That's not to say you can't write elegant and good C. It's just that the, this age of C in particular, where compilers were much more lax, tends to be also lax on const correctness. So for, for whatever reason, those, those, those strings that are inside this error data are, are mutable, both in terms of I can point them somewhere else and also I can change the contents of them, which is probably not what I meant. They are also C style strings. So who owns the memory that they, these are pointing at? Do I need to free them? Do I need to clear it up afterwards? Um, can I mutate it even if I wanted to, or am I sharing it with somebody else? There's an unnecessary type def here, which is more of an interesting difference between C and C++, where um, in C, when you define a structure, you forever have to refer to the type as struct that type. So struct area data, as you can see on this line here, this where we re refer to our self, we have to say struct area data. In C++, of course, area data is, is a valid uh, identifier now, and we could just use area data without putting struct in front of it. But in C, you had to add something. But everybody that I know ends up writing something like this, um, where you type def struct area data to be area data. So you don't have to keep saying struct everywhere. We don't need to do that anymore. The areas themselves are a global. It's hard to tell from this, obviously, this little snippet here. But it's a global variable. And global variables generally aren't a good idea. It makes it harder to test things. Of course, in C, we didn't really have a choice without going to extraordinary lengths, but it's, there's no encapsulation here. Anyone who has an area data pointer or a reference, well, obviously it's just a pointer if it's C, um, can access all of the members here and monkey with them as they see fit. There's no encapsulation, and I can't protect myself from myself, <laughs> really. So there's a lot of things we can improve here. Let's start with the simplest possible thing we can do. Let's get rid of that silly type def. So we're going to Take our code, which has struct area data, and we're going to use the shout caps version of area data because that's the minimal change. Um, I could use lowercase area data, whatever, but making it um, a struct shout caps area underscore data means that the rest of the code could be untouched. And so that's a, sm a minimal change that is an improvement. Later on, we'll rename the class, uh, and that will be when it's got a, a bit more functionality. But for now, this is a small fix. We uh, can can see if this is uh, still working. So the the, the pr principle is, as we said before, we're going to build, we're going to run, and in the moment we're going to do some manual manual testing, right? So that in this instance that just worked. That was tri trivial, no, no problems there. Let's move on to something more interesting, right? So let's take one of the fields, just literally one field, and we're going to take the name field, line three, and we're going to make it a standard string. And so we've introduced C++ at a single line of a single struct that's at the core of the whole MUD. And this is what I mean by backwards compatibility and incremental changes that you can't easily do in other languages. Well, some, but many other languages are sort of more of a big bang change. We can actually just change one element of one structure. And that's super powerful. It's a superpower. This brings us on to our first technique, CEDD. 
Now, you probably are already using this technique, you just didn't know that it had a name. And CEDD is Compiler Error Driven Development. And realistically, this is what we do all the time, right? This is how we actually refactor code. IDEs are great, and very often we can just rename things in IDEs if you're into that kind of thing. But more often than not, you just change the name of something, and then you let the compiler tell you where to the other things that need to be changed. Am I right? Now, the thing is, the compilers can only give us errors if the code actually is invalid. Now, because this is a C-style program still, there are a lot of places where we're using those name, uh, those, sorry, char star pointers in printf style functions. And, you know, you, if you're uh, balking at this char buff max string length, just you wait till we get to some of the other bits of the code. This is horrible, but it's the code that we have. We want to be minimal. So you can see here this s printf is printing to this buffer and it's saying area percent s and then it's passing p area name. Now p area name used to be a char star, but now it's a standard string. If you know anything about how printf works, you know that the way that it's defined is that there is just a C style variadic dot 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 here. You know, there's a output buffer, there's this format string, and then this is the dot dot dot. And the dot dot dot, there's no type information about this. It's just like, yep, compiler push everything onto the stack and the calling, the, the called function has to pop it off the stack and work out what to do with it. Of course, we've told printf that this is a, a char star and it isn't anymore. So I would expect this to compile, but to have horrible runtime problems when I start looking at areas, getting corrupt data, or worse still, smashing the stack in some way because printf isn't expecting something that isn't a, uh, a char star. Thankfully, modern compilers are amazing. Oh, I forgot I got a highlight there. Uh, the compiler is going to tell us that there is actually a problem. We are meant to pass a char star there. And the compiler is smart enough to know that printf is special, and sprintf is special, and all the other f functions are special and so it can understand the um uh format string enough to pick out which elements it's expecting in the variadic list this is a complete compiler you know quality of implementation improvement it's not required by anything but it's so handy because it saves me here right so i can lean on my compiler error driven development after all now obviously what is the fix for this it's pretty straightforward we just have to add dot c underscore stir at the end of this, and it's going to work. Now, later on, and this is so endemic, I didn't even put a to-do here, which would normally be the case. Later on, we're going to replace this formatting with something that's less um, quaint. And at that point, we don't actually need the c stir anymore, but we'll get to that later on. But for now, that's the fix we're going to make. That's going to get us to um, compiling. But we aren't the only people using printf style functions. There are actually some functions in the MUD that uh, we had written that um, take, formatted, take format strings and format them uh, accordingly. So this is a bit like a printf, like an sprintf, except it, points, it prints to this kind of buffer, which was our early idea of trying to get a uh, sort of standard string type thing. Oh, cat again. So unfortunately, if I'm going to use this function, then um, the compiler can't protect me, so because it doesn't know this special. But luckily, we're able to use, and this is an extension, we're able to tell the compiler, hey, this function tastes like printf. Can you treat it like printf and give me warnings like you would do for your own printf function? And there's a number of things you can do here. This is a, a, a GNU extension supported by Clang as well, but it's super useful when you're migrating old code to new formats. So it's just worth thinking about that and knowing about knowing that it exists if that's open to you. I, I didn't say at the beginning, but this whole thing is all Linux-based, by the way. And I can't get away. So we move on now, because everything's compiling. We're going to move on to the second kind of development, which is Jrazwood, or just run it and see what happens, driven development. Come on, out the way, cat. Sorry, Serafina. Luckily, our tools are saving us again. So the compiler saved us the first time around, and now the runtime is saving us. It's detected a memory leak. So I ran the program, I went north, I killed some monsters, and then I quit everything. And the leak sanitizer said, hey, you're leaking memory. I'm like, no, I'm not. I just made it better, right? I just made it a standard string. We're owning that memory now. Why is it leaking? The answer is that the old code was duplicating um, as char star to write into that area data. And then it was actually leaking it itself and wasn't caught by the um, leak detector for 
reasons to do with it had a custom memory allocator and stuff. Not important right now, but um, that's why it didn't show up in the earlier um, code. But um, the way that the, the areas are loaded in uh, means that uh, we're read reading using this fread string function, which returns um, reads a string from a file, which is tilde, you know, the tilde character delimited for arcane reasons. And it returns a static buffer, so just a pointer into some bit of memory that um, it reuses over and over again. So if we need to keep hold of that string, we need to string duplicate it using strudup. And the old code is we're doing p area name is equal to strudup of whatever. And that was fine before because that was a char star. And so you know we just held on to that pointer until the program shut down. But now what, of course, our operator equals is doing is that this is a standard string on the left-hand side, and it's not expected to own the pointer that we're assigning to it. It takes a copy for itself, and it says, well, whatever you pass to me is your problem. And unfortunately, it's nobody's problem because this stood up is just being thrown away. So that's why we're leaking memory. The fix is pretty straightforward. We get rid of the stood up. We're doing that ourselves now in the standard strings operator equals. So great. Now we build and run, and there are no more leaks, and uh, everything is great. So we can now go back to our uh, original area data, and there are some other char stars that we can do the same trick to, and we can make them standard strings as well. We now know what to look out for. We know there's going to be some places we're going to have to add .c stirrers. There's almost certainly going to be the same kind of code in the loading functionality that's going to be strud upping, and we get rid of the strud ups. Pretty straightforward at this point. So what's next? It's the next pointer, actually, uh, now that you mentioned it. I would like to get rid of that hand-rolled linked list. <clears throat> so the easiest thing to do is to get rid of that next pointer and then make a vector of areas. Seems pretty straightforward. Why wouldn't I use an STL vector? It seems like you know nobody uses lists anymore for good reason. We, uh, we might as well use a vector. And I added a to-do here. This is my first to-do here on line eight. Uh, I said, you know, we should probably make this not a global anymore. And the way that I add to-dos is I all almost always add a GitHub issue or you know, Jira ticket or whatever when I'm working um, for, for money. Um, and I can then attach the to-dos to a particular ticket so that I can know when the cleanup for a particular task is done. And uh, it also gives visibility to the folks around me that you know, there are still some things that are being worked on. Typically as well, that lives in a branch until um, it gets merged into mainline. But in this instance, this is a hobby project, so there's a ton of to-dos in the code that are perpetual. Uh, so anyway, we, we've made a vector of these things now, and um, you know the code had to be updated a little bit because previously, obviously, it was allocating some memory for each area data, and then it was chaining them into a linked list. So the code looks something like this. This is just now an example of what the code would have looked like. We, we make an empty area data, we pass the area into it, and then we're going to put it into the back of our now newly standard vectorized um, uh, area global. And then we've got some kind of horrible other global where we keep track of the current area because after loading an area, we're going to load a bunch of rooms and those rooms need to know which area they came from. So you know, we're going to assign to the, uh, the rooms area pointer to point at the area that we're currently loading. It's a bit manky, but you know, we'll get somewhere along the way um, and we won't have these horrible globals. But for now, one small step at a time. Of course, that builds and we run, and uh, thank heavens for the address sanitizer now. So the leak sanitizer saved us before, and now the address sanitizer is saving us. I'm sure that several of you were sh shouting at your screen, um, saying, oh my gosh, you're doing something silly, and indeed I was. So what's the address sanitizer telling us here? It's telling us that we, can, that we are using some memory that has been freed, but we haven't allocated or freed anything, right? The clue is this stack trace here, which is truncated so much that you can't actually see it, but in here is um, some reallocation of the vector. Um, and so what we what we realize is that this particular piece of code was in uh, the runtime. Obviously, each room has a pointer to the area. We talked about that before. And we actually go and use that during runtime. Makes sense. Um, the problem is that if we've pushed back new things into our vector of area datas, everything's moved around in memory. And we've relied we've baked in the pointers to where they were in the original vector, not the new vector that's been uh, resized. So we need pointer stability in order for the code base to work, which is, I don't think we require it. There's probably ways around it, but we're going to make it um, stable now. And the way that I've chosen to do this is to make it a vector of unique pointers. 
there are a number of ways of fixing this. I could actually have used a stood forward list, which would have been more uh, honest to the original intent. No one uses that, right? Uh, or just a regular list, because those list uh, objects uh, keep the same address even when we're adding more things to the list. But I decided to keep it as a vector because ideally I will get rid of the need for everything to be uh, address stable. Um, and by using a, a, a vector of unique pointers, the individual areas themselves are allocated once and live in the heap in a well-defined location. And as we're adding more and more and more things into the vector, all that's happening is the pointers to them are moving around, but not the actual objects themselves. And uh, Sebastian will be talking about um, moving legacy code to using smart pointers, so it seems thematic to what I'm doing here. Now we get to the good and interesting part. We're going to classify or classify. I don't know how to say that. It doesn't seem like it's, it's, it flows off the tongue as well. But we're going to turn this into a class from a struct. Now, you probably know that structs and classes are essentially the same beast. Although they, they carry a lot of semantic meaning, certainly when I read code and I see struct, I have different expectations from when I see class, they are essentially identical, the only difference being that structs start out with every member being public and classes start out with every member being private. So I can make a simple change that's totally minimal by moving the struct to being a class and then immediately making everything public, right? And that should just compile and work because there is no functional change. What that then allows me to do is one at a time start picking up individual members and making them private and then dealing with the consequences of having made that thing private. Didn't mean accessors, constructors, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, Serge is talking about um, using C++ as C on steroids on Friday, which is sort of what we're doing here. Is we're, we're, it's very much C, and we're sort of adding a little bit of extra uh, C++-ness to it, at least to start with. We're going to go a lot further along the way. So our struct area data looks like this. We make it class area data and immediately go public. And then we can build and run this, and we can even check this in, right? This should just work. We're then going to move one of the fields inside. We're going to make name into name underscore. That's just my personal convention for um, the members of uh, the private members of a function. And now, of course, things are not going to compile for a couple of reasons. Firstly, there's no way that anyone can write to the name because I haven't, I deliberately haven't written a set name function because I'm expecting nobody to have to set the name other than the thing that parses them from the file in the first place. The second reason it's not going to compile is that anything that was referring to name before used to get a standard string member and now is going to get a member function. So I'm going to have to go and put parens on a whole bunch of places in the code base. But thankfully, again, because of the compiler error driven development, compiler error driven development, the compiler will tell us that we're trying to pass a function pointer into printf and not an actual object. Or other, actually, in this instance, it will tell us that .cster doesn't work on a function pointer, it has to be a, something that's an object. So we get some errors there. It's a bit of a pain, but we do it. So let's talk a little bit about how we're going to initialize name underscore. The easiest thing to do is to make our parse function that used to be a free function that was just took a file star and an area to fill in. And we're going to make it a member function by just getting rid of the parse underscore area, making it a member function. And now, of course, this parse function can write to the name underscore private member. So that seems perfect. And it will build and run at this point, and everything's groovy. <laughs> Somebody in the chat, Pavel, has just said, another one is compiler explorer-driven development. <laughs> I didn't think of that. Thank you for sharing. So what we can do now is we can start moving the other fields into the private area. And this is pretty straightforward. Just move them both in like that. And that's great. So we've moved the first piece of functionality into our class. It's actually making it a class, what I think of as a class, an actual object, as opposed to a data structure and some supporting um, functions. So parse area become, became area colon colon parsed, parse. And we can now move some of the other functionality into this. And finally, we can write tests. Now, no one's looking, right? We could have written tests before. And honestly, I should have written tests before. But I was a bit lazy. And I'm describing this pretty honestly as I developed it. We'll see how I do TDD or more TDD-like stuff in the next section. And then once we've got the, everything uh, tested, we can start renaming things and um, feel confident that we haven't broken anything. I mean, in fact, we could even fix the parser because the parser was pretty naff um, and be pretty confident we can make changes and not break stuff.
Thank you, Fred. You won't tell anyone. <laughs> so this is how uh, this is the packed onto one um, slide uh, version of the code now. So I have actually renamed it to be class area now because instead of just being the data about an area, it is actually the area. And it has a description. I renamed it from name or short name or whatever it was because I couldn't remember which one was which. The description is the long descriptive name. And I renamed the other one to short name because it's the short name. Uh, there's a bunch of other stuff in there. I'm, I'm using, um, obviously, C++ uh, initializers so I didn't have to write a constructor that was uh, pretty straightforward. I can default the area constructor here, which I'm keeping private for interesting reasons. I'm not actually sure about this. This is... So this is a warts and all presentation. You get to see the sort of somewhat arbitrary decisions that I've made along the way. Don't, don't take this as being like necessarily recommended practice for everything. This is just how I did it. So I made the constructor private. And then instead, I now have a static parse method that returns an area. And it's sort of the named constructor pattern. I could have just made the constructor take a... Um, um, a file star and a, and a file name, but I, I don't like making constructors for things that could reasonably fail and parsing could reasonably fail. Anyway, that's just me. So the parse function is now static. It, it returns me back an area object that has been fully populated or it throws an exception if the, there was junk there. Um, player entered, player left and update are functions that I brought into the class. In fact, player entered and player, le player left were actually snippets of code that had been pasted all around the mud where um, as a player joins a particular area, we need to keep track of how many players are in that area. It affects the way that the um, area is updated. There's no point running all of the AI in an area if nobody's there to see it. That's the theory anyway. So um, this keeps track of how many people are in the area and how recently they left. Um, that's these internal state over here, the number of players and whether it's empty since the last reset are... Um, now completely private. No one needs to know these things exist. This is full encapsulation. They're only used by this entered and left, and then this update, which is called periodically to say, hey, maybe it's time to update this area. Maybe we need to respawn some monsters. Maybe we need to lock doors that were previously picked, that kind of stuff. And then, you know, we've got this uh, accesses here, and, you know, we're, we're, you know, I just renamed that. That's no different there. And then there's a whole bunch of other things in here, as you can imagine. So we've actually made a class, and we've tested it. So this is, um, I like to use catch2. It's uh, uh, my favorite testing in, um, uh, framework. Uh, one thing, if you, if you have to use legacy code, and those legacy code is sort of dialed into using capital shout file star um, things, then um, you can go far worse than using a, a mem memory-based file. If you're on a Unix-based system, you can actually create a file star from just a chunk of RAM with, uh, I think, POSIX mem file or mem file, something like that. So I wrapped that in a little class uh, called test mem file, and that allows me to make a sort of file star-like thing that um, the C code can, can consume, but I can control without having to actually write a file to disk and deal with temporary files and all that kind of stuff. So it makes it more of an actual unit test than an integration test. So this is what uh, the top of, at least, a, um, an area file looks like. I'm using the nice raw string literals here to give me a nice multi-line um, uh, example. It turned out the first thing's ignored. Uh, then there's the short name. These are these tilled delimited um, strings. Here's the short name. Here's the long description. Some numbers associated with the, the vnums of objects. It doesn't really matter in this instance. It's like the level range that it's good for between level 1 and 50. And then, you know, you can start writing things like, you know, should parse. I should have probably made this const auto area equals that because you should const all the things if you don't need them. And, um, you know, we just write some tests. Hey, these things, the file name should be Bob. The short name should be short name and so on and 1 and 50. So, and then obviously then you can test malformed things. It's just great. So that is our first class taken from 1996 era, probably before, given the, the, the length of time that area data has been around in the mud. It's not something we wrote. That's something we probably got from Deku. And bring it forward to something which looks somewhat like a modern class. Let's talk about string formatting because I glossed over it before. There's an awful lot of code in the mud that looks like this char buff max string length Ooh. and you should you know be scared every time someone has fixed size some piece of memory that you're going to be writing arbitrarily into the, the hairs on the back of your neck should go up because uh, especially when you're dealing with user inputted text 
as we are in the mud very often, because that means that potentially somebody could write a big enough string that overflows that, and then you're into all worlds of, of pain. Um, Security-related issues, crashes, all sorts. So this is an example piece of code in the mud. So this is how it used to look. We would you know, make a, a buffer, and there was about 600 references to this exact line of code, char, buff, max string length in the code when we started. Uh, we sprintf into that buffer, and you know, at least the compiler we know will, will tell us if we've got the wrong types here. Percent %d, this is obviously an integer, this is another integer, and so on and so forth. And then we send it to the player, and we give them the buffer. So that sends it over TCP or whatever. Well, the first thing we should do is attend to the wound of, well, what if this overflowed the buffer? So this is an incremental improvement on what the code will used to look like. We're going to use sn printf and pass the size of the buff there. So that's a slightly better improvement. We just have to remember to do that everywhere. Hmm? Seems, seems, uh, seems unfortunate. So one thing we could do is we could make that send to character, which I've now made a member function of some char class. We could make that responsible for the buffer and the sn printf. And so we can you know, use a C style format string and then a dot, dot, dot. And now it becomes you know, chur send to a string and then all of the parameters. And you know, that's, that's all great, provided, of course, we remember to tell the compiler, oh yeah, by the way, this looks like printf. We're going to use an sprintf inside. And then at least the sn printf, the, or the vsn printf that's inside that function is in one place, and everyone else doesn't have to worry about it. But that's still pretty horrible, right? There's so many things that can go wrong. The, the fact that it would just be truncated if it was actually longer, the fact that we have to be very careful about agreeing these things together, the fact that if any of these were strings, um, we'd have to do dot C -ster if they were C strings or not if they weren't C strings and all that kind of stuff. That's a, a pain to remember. But thankfully, and coming to a C20 near you, fmtlib is, is here, format. Um, and what format is, is a template-based printf-ish library. It's template-based, so it knows the types. It uses variadic type templates. It knows the types of all of the arguments, and it knows how to format those types. I don't have to tell it this is a number or this is a string. I just say, put the argument here, please. I still have all of the formatting um, requirements that I, I have in printf. I can do left padding, right padding, pad with spaces, all of that good stuff. Um, but I don't have to tell it what type things are. I can write my own custom... Um, formatters for my own types if I want. But really importantly for me, I can just pass in a string and it can be a char star or it can be a string view or it can be a standard string or anything that prints as a string and I don't have to keep changing the format code to deal with it. So all those dot .csters can go away if I use this kind of approach. And I think you'll agree, it's a lot better. Oh, and the other critical part here is that FMT returns a standard string. It doesn't rely on any fixed sizes of any buffers. So I don't have to worry about buffer overruns anymore. I mean, running out of memory, if someone types in a terabyte document, but that's, that's solved somewhere else. But we're not going to crash, or we're not going to give a remote code execution um, to, to somebody by, by using it. So it's just all over much, much better. Um, Oh, yeah, I've got highlights there. And yeah, the, the, it uses this sort of Python style um, brace placeholder, which takes a little bit of getting used to, but is still a, just a big win. Uh, and as, as I say, I've used libfmt, FMT lib here um, as a package in my C17 compiler. It is actually standardized as std format in C20. There are some subtle differences, and I'll talk about that in a second, but it's just such a win. You should just be using it right now. It's also super fast. It's super, super fast. So because it's been a while and I haven't shown you any pictures, I came up with this terrible thing. So if printf is the small brain and sn printf is the regular brain, tagging your own types and saying, well, I'm using printf style things is the next level up. But the best thing, obviously, the galaxy brain is to use FMT format. Just use that everywhere. And there's also FMT colon colon print. You can print to files. Or anything you could do with a file star or an O stream or whatever you can do with FMT. And it's worth saying, I didn't use um, O streams here as well because I found them unwieldy when you want to get a string out of it. You have to use like an O string stream and then you have to use your operator crocodile and then you have to do dot C stir on that or dot stir on that. And it's painful. So. FMT is just the way forward. It's a lot faster. It doesn't worry. We don't have to worry about locales and things like that too. And I thank you. People are putting uh, here, libfmt. Thank you, Oliver. Okay, manipulating strings um, is basically, um, other than formatting strings, which is a core 
a type of manipulation, I suppose you could argue. There's a lot of string manipulation in the in the mud. We would need to do stuff like, hey, capitalize the first letter and lowercase the rest, or uppercase or lowercase the whole string, or do white space trimming, or various case insensitive matching of prefixes, suffixes, infixes, parsing and tokenizing of the the player's input. You know, we have to deal with you know quoted strings and stuff. So that when you cast a spell that's got a space in its name, we have to be you know cast quote magic space missile close quote all that kind of stuff has to be dealt with and there's a lot of this and now realistically and honestly um i probably should have looked into boost um string algorithms but i didn't i always forget that they exists and i miss and miss uh attribute boost as being um uh, a big unwieldy library which it isn't now especially with conan stuff you can bring down the parts that you need so i i should have perhaps used that but it's going to let me show you some ranges code. So maybe you'll give me a pass on that. Here is the original function capitalize. What this does is capitalize the first letter of the string and lowercase the rest of the string. So the first thing we'll notice is that it takes a const char star and it returns a mutable char star. Again, C not so good with the const correctness. And the reason it can do that, it's not doing a const cast, it's doing that. It, the, is that it has its own internal buffer that's static, and it's going to return a pointer to that. So it's going to caseify, capitalize the string into its own buffer and return a temporary pointer into that. And you better hope you don't use two calls to capitalize in a way that you that you care. So if you wanted to do a printf with two things that were capitalized, you'd be in trouble. But luckily, it wasn't used that way. So we're going to fix that up. We're definitely not going to be returning a char star anymore. And then the way the code works is, you know, like nasty... Um, uh, performance inverted commas C. This is probably was actually worth doing it this way back in the day um, of uh, of the the Solaris workstation we were running this on. Really, um, with the, the 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 vintage of compilers we had. Um, so you know it, it runs from the beginning to the end of the string and it lowercases the whole thing, copy and copying as it goes, and then it terminates, null terminates it, and then it unconditionally uppercases the zeroth element of that buffer. And if the string was empty, that would be fine because uppercasing a, a null byte still leaves you with a null byte, and then it just returns that. So it's pretty, pretty horrible. Vintage compiler, yes, like a fine wine. They don't necessarily taste better after an amount of time. So um, this is my test. Now, I actually did do some test-driven development here. I actually wrote the test before I started monkeying with the code. And you can tell that I was thinking about monkeys by monkeying with it because there's all my test cases refer to monkeys here. Uh, I should have mentioned this earlier. Phil Nash is going to be talking about testing later on today. Phil Nash is the originator of the Cache2 library. And um, he's got some great ideas about how testing should be done. So I would definitely catch his, catch, haha, his talk. Pun not intended, but I'll take it. Uh, so you obviously capitalize, if you remember, returns a char star at the moment. And the way that um, catch two tests work is that you want to write them in uh, the, the, the assertions inside that check macro with just an operator equals equals. And it knows how to compare the two things left and right and give you sensible error messages. But of course, if, um, if it was returning a char star on the left-hand side and we tried to do equals equals and then a, quote just a, a string literal, the compiler would actually be comparing the the value of the char star, the pointer, with the pointer on the right-hand side. So we can't do that. So what I'm doing here to sort of hedge for the future when capitalize isn't going to return a char star is on the right-hand side, I'm comparing with a standard string. And here I'm using string literals. Um, so above here is a using namespace stood literals. And that lets me put this little s suffix on these strings, which implicitly says, make me a standard string that has the contents a monkey or a or empty string here. And that kind of means that I don't have to change this test when I start changing the capitalized function itself. Of course, I still have to change the rest of the code base that's expecting a char star from capitalized, but actually that wasn't as painful as you might imagine. So, uh, I'm sorry, it wasn't as painful as you might imagine because I had mostly ported everything over to using um, FMT, which didn't care whether it was a char star or a standard string or a string view or whatever I would decide to return. Now, when I think about testing, I don't know about you, I think about zombies. What do I mean by zombies? And uh, so zombies is something James Grenning uh, came up with. And it's just a sort of good checklist to go through in your head when you're writing a test for something. It stands for zero, one, many, boundaries, interface, exceptions, and simple scenarios. 
Here I don't have so many of the letters actually represented, but the zero one many is super, super useful. So anything that takes a sequence or an array or a vector or whatever, test it with no elements, test it with one, and then test it with many, right? And that covers an awful lot of, of ground in terms of the things that can go wrong in a function. You should test the boundaries. So if you've got um, a maximum size, you should test the maximum size and the minimum size. You should test all of the other things, um, you know, like float min, float max, nans, uh, ints if you're taking floating point numbers, that kind of stuff. You should test um, the interface. So make sure you test every at least one of every function. Uh, test uh, exceptions. I don't have any exceptions here. There's no way this can go wrong, but um, Victor will be talking about exceptions later today, so you can check out his talk if you're interested in thinking about how exceptions fit into the world. And then simple scenarios is more for like classes with behavior. You should write like very simple, like exercise the class's behavior through various different mechanisms. So I've only already got the zomb here of zombies, but um, it's useful to know and, and think about. So this is my first attempt at changing capitalize to be C++ E. And I'll be honest with you, it's not very uh, overwhelming. Uh, it, uh, the first thing I did is I returned a standard string. Hooray! So we don't have to worry about who owns the memory, and we can call capitalize as many times as we like, and we don't have to worry about various invalid old pointers. And I, this is a, essentially a transliteration of the code that was there before. I don't think I've got highlights for this one. Oh, I do, but not enough. Um, so I construct a result that I'm going to um, return. I resize it to the size of the string that's coming in. I do the to lower thing for all of the elements of the uh, incoming string. And then I two up at the zeroth element. And um, the, the brighter among you, and for me, um, you know, it, it took me a little while to get this. And thankfully for the Z, Z of zombies, this is a bug. This line here is a bug because if the string is empty, I can't do this. So it was okay to do this when it was a char buffer because you can read and write to a char buffer that you de declared yourself, but I can't get the zeroth element of a standard string if there isn't one. So I couldn't do this. So luckily the Z of the test caught that. So obviously that's not much cop. And also we shouldn't be writing raw loops these days. You know, all the, all, all the, 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 the advice is where possible use algorithms to, to do some of the work for you. So this is one attempt to at make using some of the STL algorithms. Uh, there's first of all, I've put in a horrible special case at the beginning for the empty string, which I don't like. We're going to get rid of it. But special cases in general, if you can avoid them, obviously better not to. And then I'm using standard transform for the rest of it. And um, standard transform is a bit of a frustrating API. I'm sure you've tried to use it before. I have to give it um, a, a begin and end iterator of the beginning of the stir and the end of the stir in this case. And then because I want it to accumulate results into an object that grows, I'm going to give it a back inserter, which on the result. So that's an output iterator. And then for each one of the things that we're reading, we're transforming it with this little lambda here. Ideally, I just put to, to lower here, but I have to adapt it because to lower takes an int and returns an int. And we need a char and a char. Obviously, um, this is not a great thing to do if you have high ASCII or other things that are not... Um, it can't be trivially turned to upper or lower case from a single um, character. In this instance, we're fine. Everything is very boringly low ASCII. And then, um, and I can do this because I've checked for the empty string at the top. I'm going to uppercase the, zero, the, the, the first element. So underwhelming, I think you'll agree. So let's talk about things that we can improve using some of the cool new features of C++. We've got, first of all, string views. And I think hopefully you'll know what a string view is. A string view is a lightweight pointer and length uh, tuple that looks like a string. It's a non-owning uh, string, um, and it can adapt a standard string or a char star to, um, uh, to, to both look like a string view. So if you take a string view, you can use it as a sort of lingua franca for any kind of uh, string-like thing that's being passed into you that you don't own. And that can be very powerful. Uh, it's not zero terminated. It's not guaranteed to be zero terminated, though, so you can't um, use it with C-style um, function, so you can't use it with you know scanf and stuff like that, but you shouldn't be using scanf. So string view is going to help us out a lot in terms of all the various different types of strings that we have in the code, especially while we um, we're still in an, an intermediate state. And um, we're going to use the ranges v3 library. Ranges is also coming to C plus plus twenty, albeit in a somewhat cut down form. So uh, ranges v3 allows us to um, well, let me talk about it in a second, but um, 
I'm using some features of Rangers V3 that didn't make it into the standard, which meant that even when um, I did get access to a C++20 compiler, I haven't been able to port my code to it yet. I'm hopeful for C++23, which sounds a long way off, but somehow we're at the end of 2021. So it's not that far. Uh, if you're interested in a more in-depth treatment of ranges, you should definitely, definitely check out Barry's keynote tomorrow. So what is a range? Uh, this is my super quick overview, and I am by no means an expert in this, as I'm sure you're about to discover seeing my code, but hopefully it gets you excited and interested about ranges. A range is, I think of a range as grouping together that tuple of begin and end pointer or end iterator that we're used to passing to all of the algorithms that uh, we, we, we work on, except that the range kind of holds them as a single object, as very often you want to treat it like a single object. The end, especially in ranges, can also be some different type from the begin uh, iterator. It can be a special sentinel value. So um, ranges, for example, can, can express infinite sequences. So they can be lazy, and you could say, like, give me a range that's all of the counting numbers up to infinity. You know, just keep going forever, which means that there is the end is like a magic object that you can never compare equal to. So that's that's a range. One of the cool things is that uh, the range implicitly converts from any container. So if you've got a container type, it is also a range, which is the beginning and the end of that container. And all of the range, uh, so all of the STL algorithms that are worth their salt have now a range equivalent that just takes a range instead of the begin and end, the two iterators. So for every std algorithm that you care to, to see, there is a ranges colon colon that algorithm that can just take a range. And of course, because a container is a range, finally, if you want to sort a vector of things, instead of having to do vector.sort paren vector.begin vector.end, or sorry, std sort of vector.begin vector.end or begin vector end vector, you can now just do ranges colon colon sort the vector. And wow, I mean, it's just a quality of life improvement there. The Probably the most exciting thing about ranges, though, is the views upon ranges. So you can make a view of a range which adapts the view by either mutating the elements that are going through uh, the view or dropping elements from the view or, or making other changes to the, those, um, the, the, the containers as they sort of flow through a pipeline. And they are composable using the or operator. So it looks like a Unix pipeline for those of you who use Unix. You can generate a whole bunch of, of transformations on a range and they are lazy, so the, the result of that is a range where, as you read from it, it applies all of the transformations along the pipeline. And that is what we're going to be using now. Uh, Peter made a, a comment about um, string view suffix. Yes, um, in the earlier tests, there, uh, the uh, string view suffix might be more efficient. I'm not worried about efficiency in my test, but you're right that you can do a, a quoted string with SV for string view, which I think I've got coming up in a bit, actually. But thank you for that, Peter. So this is what one reimagination of capitalized could look like using ranges. So I'm taking a string view now instead of a char star or a standard string. I'm just saying string view, I'll take anything because I'm going to return you a new object whichever way you give it to me. Um, I'm using auto because I'm lazy and I'm, it's very clear what type I'm returning at the end of this. So I start by saying return text. Now, text is obviously a string view, but it implicitly becomes a range. So I can use that and start a, a range pipeline from it. So text typed through ranges view enumerate. What this is going to do is it's going to turn the sequence of characters that are coming from text into tuples of the position in the string and the character. So zero and the first letter, one and the second letter, two and the third letter, and so on. <laughs> Sorry, there's some interesting things going on in the chat. I will, I will, I'll, keep, I'll keep going though. So that's what that's going to do. And the reason we're going to do that is because then we're going to transform the result of that. So we're going to pipe that through a transformation. That transformation is going to be given a pair now, rather than each individual character. The pair's first thing is the ordinal value, the ordinal position of the string, and the second is the character. So now we can do a discrimination based on if it's the first character, and this is first equals equals zero, means it's the first character in the range, then we're going to up return the uppercase value of the character, else we'll return the lowercase value of the character. 
So that's all well and good. So now, we, now we're, we're doing this sort of upper and lowering in one shot. There's no special case for the empty string. It just won't do anything. Um, if it's a one character thing, then it'll just hit the, the two upper and so on. So it just all works there. I love the fact there's no special cases. And then finally, we need to do something with this. I said that it was a lazy um, sequence. Nothing happens until we like were to read from it and copy it into something. And there is a handy thing in ranges called ranges colon colon two. This is unfortunately the thing that is not in the standard. Um, and I don't understand why. Perhaps Barry will talk about it tomorrow. But ranges colon colon two and then a type is a sort of magical um, variable um, that um, will convert a range coming on the left-hand side into the container type that's in the template parameters. So it will do the obvious thing here of accumulating all of the things that are coming, all the chars that are coming in, and then returning a standard string that holds all of that. So just to sort of make this a little bit clearer, um, if we put the string high in, then the first um, thing that will happen is that um, it goes through that enumerate, which returns essentially a lazy range of tuples of ints and chars that looks like 0 and h, 1 and i, 2 and exclamation mark. That gets passed into our transform function, which returns chars, which essentially means each one of those elements is mapped to h, because it's the first element, it's been uppercased, i, and then exclamation mark. And then the ranges 2 will concatenate them together and make it into the string of high. So that's maybe an improvement? I don't know. This is another way of phrasing the same thing, which is certainly more succinct. Um, so this is capitalize, and what I'm doing here is I'm using ranges concat here, which is um, a, an adapter that takes two ranges and essentially produces all of the things from the first range and then all of the things from the second range. So it concatenates two ranges together, as you'd imagine. So that's the ranges concat. The first range is the text where we just take the first character, so ranges view take means take the first thing and then that's the end of the range, and then we transform that to upper. So our first sequence is the first character uppercase, and our second sequence is all of the other characters, so drop one means take the first element and throw it away and then just do the rest of the elements, um, and we're transforming that to lower. And so obviously we concatenate the first letter uppercase and the rest of them lowercase, and we've got our capitalized function, obviously, then it goes to, to, to standard string. Now, you might be surprised that there is not a single Compiler Explorer link in this entire presentation. Uh, this would be a great point for me to show you how lovely the code it generates is, except that that's not actually true. The code is pretty unfortunate. I'm certain that things will improve um, as things go on, but certainly Rangers v3 is not going to generate you like super optimal code. Thankfully, Performance is not a consideration for me right now. And in many cases for this, these kinds of text manipulation, it probably isn't too. But it's worth knowing that they aren't necessarily the most efficient yet. But I'm sure it will improve. All right, so let me give you a real poster child for like when ranges work out well. This was a surprise to me. So I had to write a case insensitive str str. That is, I'm finding one string in another string, like a substring match, and it needs to be case sense case insensitive. So there is a GNU extension to POSIX, which is str case str. But first of all, that's horrible C. We don't, we're trying to get rid of that. And the second thing is that it doesn't work with string views because the, the C style function requires everything to be null terminated. And I wanted to take string views everywhere to make it easier to take both standard strings and char styles and all that good stuff. Let me show you a little bit of what the original code looks like. So the code is called matches inside. It took A str and B str, and it, it was sort of hand rolled out this way to make it more performant. Um, again, the, the, the fine wine legacy C compilers were not necessarily as good at doing this as, as humans. Um, I think actually we had to get rid of some of the register keywords. There were literally some register keywords in the code right in the beginning, which, which was fun. Uh, but you can see that it's horrible. Um, it essentially loops over all the things, and then it has to say for all of the left-hand side, and except for the, the left-hand side minus the right-hand side stuff, and then if it, the first character matches, which is an optimization, and then you know call out to this other function, which is up here, I didn't even put in here, it's nasty. And it's a lot of code, and it's hard to reason about. This is what it looks like with ranges. So we take a string view, uh, in both cases, the needle and haystack, rather than aster and beaster. We make a range that is a view on the original range, except that every time we look at that range, it will be in lowercase. We do the same with the haystack. So now we have needle low and needle high, sorry, needle low and haystack low. 
And then we say to ranges, can you find this range in the other range? And if, it, if we can, it's a match. And if we can't, we didn't. It's just lovely. So that was, I was very pleased when I found this, as you can probably tell. So we're, going to, we're starting to get towards the end of, uh, of, of the talk here, but I've got some other things that I want to talk about with ranges. Um, so this is one more miscellaneous things. This, this is a, um, a, a great synergy between uh, format lib and ranges. And um, unfortunately, again, this is a feature that isn't in C++20, as to, to the best of my knowledge. But how often have you found yourself with a sequence of things that for debug reasons or for actual formatting reasons, you need to print them out with like commas in between them or colons or spaces or whatever, right? And you end up writing that horrible loop where you have bool first equals true and then all, all that nonsense, right? And luckily, format has got you here. So... Um, what you can do, this is the, the string that the, your trainer, if you've just leveled up and you're going to go and train your abilities in the mud, you can train various attributes about your character unless you already train them to their maximum. And you can always train your health points and your mana, your magical abilities. So this is the kind of output we're expecting here. And the way that we're going to do it is we're going to say, you can train splat dot. And now the splat is going to say, put in a sequence here, please. And the way that we can specify as a sequence is we use FMT join. FMT join takes a range and the thing to put in between the ranges. So here I'm using to, to Victor's, uh, it's very Victor, uh, Peter's point, um, a string view uh, literal here because I wanted it to not have to construct a, a string with just a quoted space in it. So as you, as you say, this is more efficient. It's better to do it this way. So in between each of these is going to be a single space. And then what am I actually going to be concatenating? Well, I need to dynamically create something, but I can do it in line here. I'm going to take a concatenation of all of the statistics that you could possibly have where I'm filtering and dropping the ones that, that, that aren't, uh, that, sorry, that are at the max. So here I'm saying, give me the current stat. And if it's less than the amount you could possibly train it to, then keep it, else it will be thrown away. And then we're going to concatenate that with the list of things that are always trainable, which is going to be HP Amanda. It's just a, a const expert thing above the code here. And we're done. It's just lovely, right? And any time you need to do a list of things, you can use format join. And, uh, you, you know, the, the code before, you can imagine what sort of um, it was like with lots of stracats and loops and spaces and all sorts of things. Uh, another thing here is that if you start using standard array instead of just regular arrays of things, and you can imagine there's a lot of uh, old school arrays in this code, then a standard array looks like a range too because it's a container type. It knows how big it's, it is. There's no more like A size macros you need to do. And so when we were like previously um, having to loop over some array, having to know how big it was or using, you know, size of blah, 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 over size of zero, we can now just use ranges fill. And that was just a nice improvement. Uh, last example of ranges is um, just showing a way that you can build your own um, filter range um, like class, uh, functions. So here is the code for when you type yell, and the yell uh, command lets you type yell something, in, and um, uh, you see your own text, and everyone who's in the same area sees the text. So it's like a localized shout. Only a few people in the rooms around you can hear it, as opposed to there are like global communications that you can talk to people over. So there's the bit where we're sending to the current character, you yell whatever they said. And then for the, everyone else, we're going to say ranges for each. It's going to take a range and a, uh, a function to call for each of the elements to match. There's this descriptors. Descriptors is a um, thing that's going to return a, essentially all of the connected TCP connections, except for this one, because we don't want to send it back to ourselves. We need to filter it, and descriptor filter colon colon same area is just a static function, uh, sorry, yeah, a static member function of a, cl a class that just returns a range filter, takes a range and returns a filter, so it's auto something something. And it says, I want to make sure that we only keep people who are the same area as this character. And then there's this uh, thing which turns it from the descriptor, which is the Unix sort of object that's like associated with whoever's talking, to their actual character. And there's some complicated reasons why we have to do that because uh, dungeon masters can log in and they can take control of other objects and monsters and things. And so we have to do this. Anyway, it doesn't matter. But the, the end result is that we get a list of all of the characters that are currently connected into the mud that are actual people. And um, we can then send a line to each of them saying, hey, 
you know, Bob yells whatever Bob yelled. And this described for here, incidentally, is the way that um, one character is described to another, which may be different based on whether you, one character can see the other, whether they're invisible or they're, you know, higher level and all that kind of stuff. So that's pretty cool. But wait, there's more. Uh, there are a whole bunch of other really good improvements that I don't have time to go into. Um, and I, I can't cover them here, but obviously there's a lot of ints and type defs in the old code for, you know, like, hey, this is your, your st statistic of, is just int. And you're like, well, no, it isn't. It's a, it's, a, it's a statistic of this particular type. So it's your armor class, for example. Well, that's not a number. It's, it's, it's a strong type. Let's give it behavior. Um, we, uh, we can, a lot of things were hash defined as being, you know, various shout caps things, and we can make them into enums and enum classes. Uh, there are a number of bit fields and we were able to use a third party, um, enumerate class to make that relatively transparent to have like type safe, um, bit fields. Um, you can imagine that a lot of the, um, parsing, um, stuff relies on a big table of person types, this, this is the function you should call. And um, that was just a function pointer. And if by making it a standard function, we could start changing the behavior in an incremental way, which I had a whole bunch of cool slides on, which I, I, we haven't got time for. Um, a number of things uh, had to use like special sentinel values for like, I couldn't parse this out of the string or this is not there. And obviously std optional gives us an ability to do that in a principled way. So now if we try and parse an integer, you use try parse and you get an optional integer. And that makes sense, right? Standard variant was also a really useful thing to put in. There were a number of places where there were some void star pointers and a type that went alongside of it. And obviously that's asking for trouble. And luckily we could work out which types could be passed. And then instead of taking a void star, we would take a variant of the possible things that could be passed in that particular parameter. So it was, it was pretty cool. What regrets do I have? Well, first of all, I haven't finished it. It's an ongoing process. And it's also worth saying that in the last few months, um, I've been working on this presentation rather than the code. And uh, my, uh, my co-contributor, um, Faramir, is, is, has been working on the actual code base. So if you look at the most recent check-ins, they're all from, from, from him. So what, what do I regret? Well, I would have loved to have got to the point where I could run a fuzzer over the input because although I've improved the parser using standard strings and no longer having fixed size things, it would be lovely to... <laughs> Excuse me. Lovely to throw um, a fuzzing library or AFL American fuzzy lop at, at at the code and develop more confidence that there aren't horrible gremlins in the parser or the formatting code anymore. So that would have been great. Would have been a cool story to have at the end to say, and hey, we found all these bugs with it. Uh, it would be a great to have actually gotten to the point where I have done the to do to deglobal some of the globals. Um, I, I really, really wanted to get to the stage where I had a good principle for extracting globals and making them not global anymore. The way that it's currently going is that most of the globals have now become singleton pattern style um, things, which means that, um, uh, and then I'm passing those singletons to many, many functions where I'm calling methods on those functions. So they're not relying um, on accessing the global in many, many places, just a couple of places that access the singleton, and then they're passed around by ref to everything else. That's a sort of hook for me to eventually hoist everything into one big class, like class mud, that's going to own all of the areas, all of the monsters, all of the objects, all of the whatever, and then we can get rid of those singletons. And obviously C++20 would have been cool, right? But we are where we are. I guess I should have some kind of conclusion for you all. One second. Well, somehow, in amongst all of this, even though I've added a bunch of tests, the code is now 8,000 lines fewer, which is pretty cool, right? Anyone wants to maintain large code bases, I mean, that's not, that's not a thing that I would like to do. Smaller is better in this instance. Some of that came from deleting all of the boilerplate around all of the char buff as printf types nonsense and turning it into just FMT column column stuff. So that was a lot of the, the savings. I think actually there was also some large swaths of code that were unused to be deleted. So this is not necessarily the fairest comparison, but we've added tests as well. And that's counted here. So, you know, we're doing something right. And we've gone from 700 lines of Perl and make to 90 lines of C make, which is, I think, an improvement. What helped us along the way? So compiler warnings and errors 
compilers are amazing. I think the, the theme of all my talks is compilers are amazing, um, thanks to compiler writers. And the warnings and the errors that we have, even for things that you wouldn't expect, are amazing. The sanitizers are a lifesaver. And honestly, um, in my day job, there is not a project that I, I run now whose debug build it doesn't have all the sanitizers I can possibly afford to have on uh, with at all times. And, you know, I find that if, if, you're, if you can suffer your code being slower because it's not optimized for, for debug, you can probably suffer it being running under the, the, the sanitizer and being even slower. And you will find so many things. You should definitely run your test with sanitizers on. You know, compiler error-driven development, tongue-in-cheek, you know, that's, that's definitely helped us. Uh, and, you know, some kind of test, test-driven is too strong, right? You saw how it, it, I didn't really apply it. But those were, those were helpful. And of course, the big thing that helped us do this is backwards compatibility. That's what allowed me to lift all of that code and with the exception of renaming class uh, and template, have it running in a modern compiler pretty much straight away. So let's talk about that. Oh, well, we've got one extra slide. Never put slides in at the last minute because you're then surprised when they appear. So the benefits of modernizing your code, this is a bit of feedback I had from an earlier um, run of this talk. It's like, you know, well, first of all, if, the, if it compiles just fine with your compiler now, why the heck would you touch it? And I think I'd like to talk to that. So I find it a lot easier to find and fix bugs in the modern code than it is in the old code. And if you're going to be making any changes at all, it's definitely worth um, modernizing it so that you aren't worrying about um, buffer overflows or underflows or weird C style um, parameters that now you need to use some thread safe version of that you didn't before or that have internal buffers like Stratoc and stuff like that. So there's a lot of things that are nicer if you can modernize code from like C era. I find it easier to understand, you know, a lot of that stuff. I mean, maybe not ranges. If you're not used to seeing ranges, then and you looked at that range code I showed you, and you went, "Oh, I don't know about that." You, then you know that's fine. I don't, you know, C plus plus is multi paradigm. You can choose not to do that kind of stuff, but you can certainly write it in a more um, understandable way. Now you don't have to pander to old compiler nuances and performance characteristics. It also. I'll be honest with you, it keeps coders happy, right? If you're using the most modern standard of something, I think you feel better about being not trapped in, in, uh, in, in an old uh, code base and an old style of, of writing code. And the really key thing here is that if you can do this incrementally, like one line at a time sometimes, then it keeps both your customers and your management happy because you can continue to release software. There isn't a big rewrite in your future. You can say, oh, I'm turning on this feature and now I'm going to use it. And I can still ship a, a version of my code at any time. And that's a really powerful thing. So in the past, um, I mean, some of you, I'm sure, are, are um, responsible for code that is at least 20 years old, or at least originated more than 20 years ago. So my example is not even at the far end of what is reasonable for code bases. And backwards compatibility as C++'s superpower has allowed me to take that code and run it today. And so it benefits me in that way. But you might go, why, why should I care about that? I don't have old code. Again, some of you might, but most of us, hopefully, are running on somewhat contemporary code. So one thing I'd like you to think about is the next time you change your C++ revision from C++ 11 to 14, from 14 to 17, from 17 to 20, and so on, you're taking advantage of that backwards compatibility right now. You are able to move that standard forward and you can be very confident that your code is going to continue to work. So that backwards compatibility from C++ 17 back to C++ 14 means that it's relatively straightforward to move from C++ 14 up to C++ 17. The other uh, aspect of that, though, sorry, forgive me, um, that is actually what caused Compiler Explorer to be written in the first place, was as we were... Um, developing from pre-C++11 to turning on the C++11 flag and using ranges and stuff, we were starting to not, not trust the compiler because I didn't know the, how, how hard the C++ committee and the compiler writers work to keep things backwards compatible. And so we had to prove to our management that like, by changing the flags from C++ not to C++ OX as it was and using like range-based fours and things that we weren't materially affecting the code generation, which we weren't. In fact, it was improving it, right? So backwards compatibility helps you right now. It lets you use a mishmash of old and new together 
in your current code base. And of course, if you are writing some code that you expect to work in the future, maybe not 25 years time, but five years time, 10 years time, C++ makes it so that you can be very confident that your code today will continue to work in the future. So that's sort of forwards compatibility, if you like. And that's a very powerful thing. You, don't, you won't have a problem where you'll get orphaned on a branch of a language where you will have to like use an old compiler to build it. I mean, obviously, it, oops, excuse me, that is unfortunate. I thought I turned it off. So C++'s superpower is its backwards compatibility. Maybe I've persuaded you, maybe not. Maybe you still think RAII is the best thing, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't blame you. But I wanted to at least explore the reasons why C++'s most disliked features, misfeatures, you know, the, the bad defaults and everything, why they're important and how they allow us to do things that actually help the longevity of the language. Part of the reason C++ is so sticky, that's stayed around for so long, is because of this backwards compatibility. We wouldn't be here talking about it if it wasn't and it had died out in, in, in like the, the 90s or whatever. Um, I've got some quick thanks um, to the, the, my university housemates from the 90s, who actually, most of whom actually came back and contributed again. Um, Rob Snell uh, is Faramir, who I just mentioned earlier, is still actually working on it now. Uh, thanks to the, the, the various developers of Deku and ROM who open sourced their code back in the day when open sourcing stuff was not easy. Uh, Hannah did all of the wonderful pictures, and um, I had some great feedback from my, my co workers at Aquatic and the C Denver meetup group. Uh, this is the end of my talk, so thank you so much for your attention. The source to this is on um, GitHub if you want to go and have a laugh. Um, somebody tried it out actually over the weekend, and apparently they couldn't get it to build, so that's unfortunate. Um, you can, in fact, play it if you really, really want to. You can turn it to mud.zania.org port 9000. Um, I will make no um, assumptions about any help you might get. I'll see if I can stay around long enough to help anyone if you're stuck in it. And remember, maybe your code will still compile in 2046. Thank you. Oh, and one last thing, it is the BBC Micro, the, the, the computer that got me started in computing. Uh, it's its 40th birth, birthday today, and um, my friends and I just launched something called virtual.bbcmic.ro. Um, go check it out if you, are, if you know what a BBC Micro is or you want to go and see what quite crazy things you can do with the web these days. So thank you all for your attention, and uh, um, I will be in, I will be taking some questions if there are indeed some questions over here. There are. So um, let me have a quick look over here. I'm going to answer uh, Unico support. I know you're just kidding, Pavel. Uh, no, <laughs> unfortunately not. I know too many too many acquaintances and friends of mine have been driven to to madness by trying to get Unico to work in a sane way. Uh, so that's not going to happen, I'm afraid. Uh, Loic, uh, Loic, sorry, I, I'm, if I'm mispronouncing your name, I apologise. Um, upgrading the code would have required changing the network stack. Uh, the network stack? No, I mean Unix is. Um, uh, network stack has not changed in in the many years. Um, you know, it's been basically the same since the late seventies, I think. So, um, uh, actually, there's a kind of an interesting thing about the network. I said the one significant contribution that I had made most latterly was separating the mud into two components. One bit that was the Unix stack, and then a separate process that was the mud, and they communicate over Unix domain sockets. And there's all sorts of clever, I thought, clever tracks. Um, so uh, the network side didn't have to change, thankfully. Um, so if there's any other questions, um, I will be happy to chat about this forever. I know it's early. And um, yeah, I, I... I have oh. a question, Matt. Yes, uh, hey. I, as a, an organizer, I'm not allowed to send questions through Zoom for some reason. Oh, I see. I, so you have to like just butt in. Exactly. Really and <laughs> so I'm butting in. Sorry for that. Um, did you try to use kind tidy or tools like that, you know, that can modernize yeah. the crowd automatically, but it's that's an excellent question. Works. Yeah, no, that's a brilliant question. Um, no, I haven't actually. Uh, that's, a, that's something we should definitely do. Um, it's, it's something that in my day job, I'm pretty passionate about having as many uh, linters and Clang Tidy, obviously, as well as tidying your code is a great linting um, program to sort of say, hey, you're doing this. Um, no, we should, we should definitely give it a go. And I know that you have some experience personally with writing um, like special um, Clang Tidy rules. Am I right? Yeah, you, you're right. But uh, so, yes, they already have a few modernized rules that usually work. Uh, also, if you have very old C, uh, 
sometimes they didn't think about, hey, you can't put uh, a forward declaration at this place. Uh, yeah. I see. <laughs> yeah, no, that's an interesting point. I forgot that it actually can automatically change your code. And I know I've seen the warnings that come out of uh, some of the things that it can it, it does. Yeah. But yeah, you, you actually could say, yeah, like, hey, don't pass dot .cster if you don't need to kind of stuff. Yeah. Awesome. No, I hadn't thought of that. That's, that's uh, I haven't got enough time for my hobbies as it is. So <laughs> unfortunately, this might not come to pass, but we'll, we'll think about it. Thank you for that. And thank you for the other questions as well. Um, if that's, if that's everything, then I think we're, we're basically at time, even though I had extra time to start with. <laughs> I like a gas, I, I expand to fill all available space. I will, I will be around to chat. We can pick a random salon, uh, so chat room two looks empty. If I've been, oh salon two looks empty, so I will I will camp out there for a bit longer if people want to talk. Otherwise, I'll hand it back to you, Fred. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, it was an excellent talk. I'm very happy we had you as the first keynote. Well, thank you. I'm. I know we've we've talked about doing this before, <laughs> and I'm just glad that it finally came to pass. And you know, I wish everyone a fantastic conference. Um, for time zone related reasons, I won't be around as much as perhaps I'd like yes, to, but I will be bit. here. <laughs> ah, it's fine. I'll sleep uh, next week. <laughs>